Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. In case you don't know me, I am Dr. Ali. I'm an OBGYN and here on my YouTube channel, we talk about all things women's health from periods to pregnancy to literally everything and anything. I also share bits and pieces of my life as a full-time OBGYN, my life in medicine, lifestyle, vlogs, vacations. So if you're not already part of this little family, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and join us. So today's YouTube video is actually going to be dedicated to one of my followers who is also a patient of mine. She motivated me to make this video because she gave me the idea. She had never had a C-section before and was going to have her very first one. And during my pre-op visit with her, kind of going over the C-section, she said she was really nervous and that she tried to Google and YouTube exactly what happens during a C-section. And she was saying that she could not find a good video explaining. She said she just ended up getting really frustrated and got really scared of some of the stuff that she found. So. Because of her, I am now making this YouTube video explaining exactly what goes on during a C-section. I even have this cool little felt model that I made. I made it a long time ago and I posted it over on Instagram maybe over a year and a half ago. But today we're gonna go into all of the details, exactly how things happen if you are scheduled for a C-section. All right, let's jump into it. Little dance clip. Scheduled C-section, what does that even mean? For some women, this could mean that, that they have a history of multiple C-sections or they've had one C-section and they want a repeat C-section. So we typically schedule repeat C-sections at 39 weeks. Obviously, if there's some other fetal or maternal indication to do it earlier, then we can do it earlier. But typically a repeat scheduled C-section is done at 39 weeks. Some people may opt to have a primary or a first C-section, or maybe they're pregnant with twins and both of those little babies are breech or they have their bottoms down. That would be an indication to have a C-section. Maybe you have a placenta accreta or a placenta previa. There are multiple reasons why someone may need to have a scheduled C-section. So if you have a scheduled C-section, this is typically what happens. Now remember that hospitals across the United States are not all the same. So maybe they have different policies, different time frame as far as how early you should get there before or your c-section typically if you're scheduled for let's say a 7 a.m c-section they may want you to get there two hours before or maybe even more now the reason we have you get there so early are for a couple reasons first of all we want to make sure that you meet everyone that's going to be around for your care you'll meet the nurses you'll meet the anesthesia team you obviously will meet with your OBGYN who's going to do your surgery and we also need to get blood work drawn so before a c-section we want to make sure that we have your hemoglobin your hemoglobin is an indication of your blood count and we want that number to be high because like with most surgeries during a c-section you do lose quite a bit of blood so we want to make sure we know what your starting hemoglobin is so that we can prepare if you lose too much blood. There's also other labs that we get and every patient's gonna be different. Maybe you wanna get more labs on one patient versus the other. So just be prepared for once you get there for you to have some blood drawn and have an IV started so that you can get some fluids before the surgery. Another thing that we do before a C-section is give the patient antibiotics. Obviously one of the risks that come with surgery are infections and as a means to prevent an infection from forming, we want to give the patient antibiotics before the surgery. And of course, we will put you on the fetal heart rate monitor. So those are gonna be those two bands that go over your belly. One is going to trace your baby's heart rate and the other one is going to monitor your uterine activity. Now that you've met your entire team, we have your blood work back, your baby looks excellent on the monitor, it is time to go back to the operating room. Before I jump in here, Typically in most hospitals, they will allow one family member or one support person to be with you in the operating room during the surgery. So what happens when you actually get to the operating room? First and foremost, the first thing when you get into the operating room is you need to sit on the operating table and get your spinal anesthesia. Most C-sections are going to be done under a spinal anesthesia, which means that most patients are going to be awake during the procedure. Now, occasionally if there's an emergency or if there's some con indication to a spinal anesthesia then some women do have to be put to sleep under general anesthesia before a c-section this is typically more rare and usually only used in cases of emergencies when you get your spinal anesthesia that is going to be placed by the anesthesiologist or a crna you're going to be in a very similar position as you are if you were to get an epidural while in labor once the anesthesia is in place you'll really start to feel the heaviness or the numbness in your legs and feet 
pretty quickly. So we will lay you back down on the operating table. Also keep in mind that during this time, you may notice there's a lot of people in the room and that's okay, that's very common. You'll have your anesthesiologist in the room, you'll have your nurse, you'll also have another circulating nurse that is kind of just going around the room, making sure everything's in order or helping the scrub tech. So the scrub tech is another person that's going to be in the room and they're the ones that help the surgeon or the OBGYN during the surgery. They make sure all of the surgical instruments are accounted for and that they're in place and in order. Some hospitals may also have a NICU nurse or a neonatal nurse that is going to take care of the baby once the baby's born, monitor the baby's vitals, all that stuff. Again, every hospital is a little bit different, but plan to see quite a bit of people in the operating room. Once you lay back down after the spinal anesthesia, then we start preparing you for surgery. One of the most important parts of the surgery is to have a Foley catheter in place or a catheter inside of the bladder. Because during the surgery, the bladder is very close to the uterus, which I'll demonstrate in a little bit with this, we want to make sure that your bladder is empty during the procedure. The nurses will position your legs in a way that makes it easier easier to place the Foley catheter. Typically your legs are butterflied out so that we can get a good visualization of the urethra. The catheter is placed inside of the bladder and the bladder is empty and continuously the urine will drain out. The catheter will stay in place the entire surgery and then a couple hours after as well. After that is done, we'll make sure and prep your skin. So we want to make sure that your skin and where we're going to be operating is sterile. So we can use different solutions to kind of paint over your belly and make sure that everything is nice and clean. After that, you're going to notice that we place a big blue drape over your body. So like I mentioned, we want to make sure everything stays sterile. So the big blue drape is honestly a huge drape and there's a cut out portion of a circle that just goes directly over your belly in the area where we're going to be operating. While you're laying down in the bed, you're going to see a big blue drape over you. The next step after this is to do a test to make sure that you're nice and numb and that you're not going to feel anything. Now it is very common during the surgery to feel pressure. So almost like pushing on your skin or your belly, you should never feel anything that is sharp, shooting, cutting, burning, anything like that. It really is just pressure. So we'll make sure that the anesthesia is working. And then the next step is to do what's called a time out. This is something that is done before every surgery or every procedure. And it's a way for all of the different teams to communicate and be on the same page. We'll go over your name, your date of birth, why you're there and what procedure you're having done. The nurse starts it off and says all of those components. Anesthesia repeats back to make sure your name, date of birth, everything is aligned. The scrub text announces what kind of surgery and what instruments she has prepared for. And then I, as a surgeon, also then confirm everything. Everything is confirmed and we all agree that we're there to do a C-section. Then we can bring your support person or your family member in the room. That support person or family member is going to take a seat right by your head, essentially. We put a chair right next to you so that they can, you know, hold your hands, they can see you and be in the room. And we typically ask that person to stay seated down and not stand up because we've had a lot of people stand up and they do end up fainting or passing out because of either the blood or they're nauseous or uncomfortable. So remind your support person to stay seated down because we don't want anyone to pass out in the OR. Now let's get to the good stuff. I'm gonna use my little felt model here to go over the different layers and what exactly we do during the C-section. Now most C-sections are done with this fan and steel skin incision. This is typically what we refer to as the bikini line incision. The first layer that we cut through is going to be the skin. Next layer, underneath the skin, immediately the layer that we see is fat. Everyone has this layer of fat that is extremely common. Absolutely everyone has it. Next, we have one of the most important layers. This is going to be your fascia. Your fascia is essentially what holds together your entire abdominal wall. This is a layer, it's very white, it's pearly, very identifiable in everyone. Once we get to the fascia, we make another incision and right underneath the fascia, we see your rectus muscles. Now, as you can see here, the incision that I made on this felt is the opposite way. This was more so to signify that your rectus abdominals muscles, you have one on the right and on the left and they come together right here. So these muscles are opened and separated so that we can get to the layer right underneath that. And that is going to be the peritoneum. Now the peritoneum is very 
thin tissue that's going to line your entire abdominal wall. This layer is so, so thin that honestly, we can just poke a finger through to get past this layer and back into the next layer. Now, if this is someone who has had multiple C-sections, this surgery is going to look different. Not all the layers are gonna be nice and pretty and perfect. Once you've had one C-section, then there is going to be scar tissue involved. So a lot of these layers may be stuck down together. So in repeat C-sections, they typically take longer than a primary or first time C-section patient that is because of the formation of scar tissue so we want to make sure and take our time with each layer so that we can identify each layer and make sure we separate them correctly all right now we're past the peritoneum the next thing we're going to see is your uterus and this yellow portion right here is signifying the bladder so the bladder is where your urine is remember how i stated earlier that you're going to have a fully catheter that catheter sits inside of the bladder make sure the bladder is empty and it helps push the bladder down so that is not as close to where we make the uterus incision. Oh, because this patient is pregnant, the uterus is enlarged. So once we get past the peritoneum, you are going to see the uterus first. Say for example, this is another type of surgery on a non-pregnant patient. You would not see your uterus first. In someone who is not pregnant, the thing that you would encounter right after the peritoneum is the bowel or the intestines. Now I think this is a big misconception. So a lot of people really think that during C-sections, we have to remove or kind of take out your intestines to get to your uterus. This is not true. Because the uterus is gravid and so enlarged, it actually kind of pops up in front of the intestines and the intestines tend to hang out behind. Now, if this is someone who isn't full term and you're doing a C-section on someone earlier, maybe at 24 weeks, 28 weeks, then yes, maybe some of the intestines are near to the front. But in a full term pregnancy, the uterus does a pretty good job of pushing all of those intestines out of the way to the point that during most C-sections, we don't even have to mess with the bowel. Now that we get down to the uterus, we're going to make this low transverse incision on the uterus. Now there may be some cases or some indications to do what's called a classical c-section incision where instead of making this low transverse inc incision we make one that goes vertically again every case is going to be different it's going to depend on the patient situation but for the majority of c-sections this is the type of incision that we make so we make our uterine incision and we're one step closer to baby the next layer right before we get to the baby is going to be the amniotic sac this is that bag of water that your baby is in this layer again is pretty thin and a lot of the times we can either use a small clamp to make a hole in it or sometimes even just our finger. Once we get through the amniotic sac, then we're to the baby. Now, this is just tiny little models of babies that I purchased at the store, but obviously a full-term baby, say they're in cephalic presentation or head down, the first thing you're going to see is that fetal head. Then you'll start to raise that fetal head up to the incision and deliver that baby. All right, so that essentially concludes exactly what we do during a C-section. This goes over all of the layers that we encounter before we actually get down to the baby and then deliver the baby. A little baby is delivered. Even during a C-section, we can still do delayed cord clamping. We know that there are multiple benefits to delayed cord clamping. The recommendation is to do it for 60 seconds as long as the baby appears well and is vigorous. For that, then we can clamp and cut that umbilical cord and hand the baby off to the awaiting nurse so that the nurses can look at the baby, do the vitals, take the measurements, all that good stuff. Some hospitals do allow the mother to do skin to skin or even to start breastfeeding while we finish up the C-section. Make sure to ask and see what the hospital policy is so that you can prepare. So the baby is handed off to the nurse, we deliver the placenta, and the remainder of the surgery is working our way back. Obviously, no more amniotic sac, that goes with the placenta. We close up and suture the uterus back together and put the peritoneum back together, the muscle, then we close the fascia, we can put back together some of the subcutaneous fat, and then we close the skin. Nowadays, we typically use a suture that goes underneath the skin, so they dissolve on their own. There's no sutures that you need to come back and have removed. Some cases, maybe we'll have to use staples. Everyone, again, is gonna be different, but typically the suture goes underneath the skin and we're done. We're done with the surgery. We take down all of the sterile field and the blue drapes. We clean off your abdomen and we get you moved over into the PACU or the recovery room. There in the PACU and the recovery room, you will typically stay there for one to two hours. We make sure your vitals look okay, that your urine 
output or that your bladder is putting out a good amount of urine. You make sure that you're not having any sort of heavy bleeding vaginally. And that's when you get to hold your baby, breastfeed if you want to, bond with your new baby. And we can slowly start to introduce food. We usually start with ice chips, water, and then advance your diet as you tolerate it. After you've fully recovered from the PACU, then you will be moved into your postpartum room. And that is essentially my quick explanation of what exactly happens during a C-section. I hope you all found this video helpful. I really had fun making this little felt model. I think this is also going to be a pretty good video. So anyone who wants to become an OBGYN, maybe you're in med school and studying, these layers of the abdominal wall are extremely important and something that you should know. All right, so that brings us to the end. I hope you guys liked this video. Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions, if you liked this video, what videos you would like to see in the future. Go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you liked this video and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so that you can become part of this little family. I hope you guys learned something new today. Thank you so much for always showing me so much love and support. You all mean the world to me. Don't forget to always be kind and show love to everyone around you. I love you guys. Have a good week. Bye.